This is a reading of chapter 3, Begin a New Life, titled Friends of God, the Biblical Psychology of the Casey Council. The term Friends of God is from John 15, verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. The meaning of biblical psychology, biblical means relating to the Bible, and psychology means the study of the mind and its functions, study of the personality, study of the mental processes, mental characteristics or attitude of a person or group. Biblical psychology means using the Bible as aid to our spiritual and mental life, using the Bible for the mind and spirit, deep mental study of the Bible, using the Bible to guide us towards oneness with God. Edgar Cayce's reading suggested a model of man with God. The model was biblical in its concepts and metaphors, yet psychological in its emphasis on practical steps of exploration and growth. Edgar Cayce's prayer was the natural expression of the way in which he thought about man's relationship to God. It sprang from a foundation of ideas, a conceptual structure, which was both his own and that of his readings. The substance of that structure could be set forth in the concept of friends of God, as pointed out in a reading on Christ's way as the ideal for every man. Here then, ye find a friend, a brother, a companion, as he gave, I call ye not servants, but brethren. For as many as believe, to them he gives power, to become the children of God the Father. The point of Jesus' original figure of speech, reported in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, was that friends understood the work in which they were engaged, while servants did not. Just such a high promise of man's understanding the lawful pro processes of God's grace was central to Casey's own faith and to the conceptual framework of his trance council. A friend of God would pray as Casey had prayed, neither in ignorance of the work done with him, nor in ignorance of how little he yet understood about it. The term Friends of God has had a long history in Christian writings appearing in early centuries of the Church. But Friends of God distinctive usage has come to be that of designating an adventurous awakening of mystical faith during the 14th century in the activities of an informal movement which originated in Germany and spread to Switzerland. Those who call themselves friends of God were earnestly dedicated to that growth in conscious communion with the divine, which has always been central to mysticism, and they spoke of faith as a graded search through growth in the lower and upper schools of the lower Holy Spirit. They set about their praying and speaking and writing within the organized structure of the late medieval church, although they were keenly aware of its corrupt features which needed spiritual cleansing, and despite the sting of public and private reproach, even at times condemnation, which their leaders had to bear for their, their kind of faith. Three names stood out in this little but wonderfully restless and turbulent movement. Eckhart, Taula, and Suso, all three Dominican friars. Meister Eckhart was the scholar of the free, combining intellectual system and careful thought, which made him one of the fathers of German philosophy, with passionate devotion to God, both of which shown in his sermons in native German, which have been his chief memoirs. John Toller was a missionary preacher, 
traveling his German homeland to call his countrymen to new depths of personal relationship with God, while keeping a rare and convincing sense of humanity in balance with his intense spirituality. Suso was the visionary ascetic, often physically torturing himself to quicken the devotion of his heart until his own inner guidance forbade him to do so. He provided the introspective chronicles for the free, recording in detail what the others handled more circumspectly as he wrote as servitor in German of his experiences with the Divine Presence appearing to him as shining brightness or in some other mode. Around these free, devout, virile and appealing men there gathered in no formal structure many other figures who felt the need of quickening by the life of the Spirit in their times and who determined to set about such quickening without delay. There was the nameless author of the mature yet ecstatic Theologia Germanacia or book of the perfect life and there were others who wrote letters wrote accounts of their conversions to Christ and tried their hands at small mystical treatises women had a vigorous part in the movement as has often been in the case in Christian and Muslim mysticism among the leading women in the friends of God were the Ebna sisters Margaret and Christina Margaret, in particular, appeared to have abundant telepathic and clairvoyant abilities springing out of her devotions. In this respect, she was a kind of forerunner of the physically gifted leaders of the informal and spontaneous Jewish mystical movement, the Hasidim, which developed several centuries later, not far from the homeland of the Friends of God. Edgar Casey's personal determination to work constructively within organized church life, his high-spirited invita invitation to others to join him in service through conscious attunement to the divine, his drawing to him of men and women who grew into deep mystical faith and produced with him small manuals of growth and grace, and above all, his infectious sense of personal relationship with God, as evidenced by the spontaneous prayer in his study, all make the term friends of God useful su to suggest his conceptual model for thinking about man's bonds and opportunities with God, in terms not far removed from those of his 14th century predecessors. But the sense of friends of God shown most clearly in Casey Count's Trans Council where it carried distinctive emphasis and richness of development, the religious ideas of the Casey information began to emerge early in his giving of medical readings, where they both puzzled and interested some of the doctors and reporters who investigated his work. Only after the early 1920s, however, were careful transcripts kept on Casey's counsel, in which the development of religious themes might be traced. By the early 1940s, as many as two-thirds or three-fourths of the medical readings had some form of religious content, though it might be only a warning of psychosomatic consequences from negative attitudes toward others traced through specific nervous and glandular reactions. But it was in his life readings of vocational and character analysis begun in 1924 and represented by more than 2,000 readings at the time of his death, where religious themes were so prominent as to be central, though set in material which was chiefly devoted to talents, interests, trends and complexes in the personality. The same linkage of religious concepts with psychological structures and dynamics appeared in interpretations of some 700 dreams submitted to the entranced Casey, chiefly by himself and three others. The Casey information saw dreams as developing not only around biological and psychological dynamics in the person, but as sometimes embodying such close attunement with the divine as to produce visions and quickenings by the spirit, as the writer has reported in Dreams and the Life of Prayer. 
Similar religious concepts were always in the background and sometimes in the foreground of some 800 readings offering counsel on business ventures and decisions, as they were also in a score given on the home and married life of couples who sought counsel together. However, the clearest expression of the religious concepts of the Casey Council often appeared in what we were called mental and spiritual readings given to those who requested direct analysis of their growth in relationship to God. Strongly biblical in their tone and imagery and emphasis, these nearly 400 readings were of a type which Casey delighted in giving, as the writer often observed, because he knew that those who sought them typically did so in humility asking for none of the immediate rewards or marvels which might lie in medical or business or personality analysis readings. Supplementing the thematic material in these readings were some of the 900 special readings which Casey gave on various topics. Among these were readings on such subjects as historical events in the life of Jesus, religious dimensions in cultivating stable psychic ability, the meaning of Easter, conflicts of faith in ancient cultures, and how faith might be put to work in the day-to-day -day life of the Casey Hospital or the Casey Oriented Research Association. While the distribution of re the religious ideas of the Casey Council among all these types of readings and thousands of pages of documents has made careful study of them difficult, as has the endless couching of ideas in terms and phrases chosen for their meaning to individual counselees, still the main ideas of the Keynesian materials stand out clearly enough. Similarly, the tone and spirit of the religious council were not difficult for those who heard it to identify. Never pontifical, never scolding or accusatory, it varied from intimate appeal and quiet unfolding to those rare times when it became so fury and challenge as to sear the minds of those who, like the writer, heard the burning rebukes. At times, when the Casey information touched themes which had great weight for Casey as well as for the seeker, the discourse shifted to elevated poetic style with an unforced but hushed eloquence that left a mark upon the listeners equal to that of the hot challenges. There seemed little to suggest partisan approval of Jews or Christians, both of whose traditions received central attention in these readings, nor did the Casey source exalt itself as offering revelations, insisting on the difference between the inspirations and quickening which might come to an individual with or without the aid of readings, and the historic tested revelations which grew out of the shared experiences of a covenanted people of faith. In both its conceptual content and its manner of expression, the Casey Trance source developed a model for thinking of men as friends of God, for which the precise phrase in the readings was co-creators with God. The end of man, as it was often put in the Casey Council, was to have that estate with him which was in the beginning and be conscious of same. Consciousness, full understanding of divine will and way, was critical to human growth, befitting those who should not be his servants, but his friends. Comprising the model for religious thought in the Casey readings, were several structures which man was destined to understand in his journey to the final estate with God, where he would be conscious of same. There was God seen as the creative forces, there was God's creation seen in free modes, there was man seen as a soul in a layered being, and there was the helping Holy Spirit focused for man by Christ. One God the creative forces. As the central religious reality, the Casey source pointed steadily over the years to one force within and behind all of creation. 
by emphasizing the unity of this one while at the same time suggesting its richness and creative potential that allowed it to be present with stars and men and angels alike. The Casey readings was against any kind of dualism, whether of spirit and matter, or man and non-human creation, or even of God and man. Yet at the same time, the readings did not hesitate to describe the goodness and patience of God as making him different from man. Between God and man was always that impassable gulf created by God's potency and love, a gulf which man could bridge but not close by steady alignment of his present reality. The Casey Council often employed interchangeably the phrase one force with the plural phrase for God, the creative forces. The term creative forces was used to make clear that there was no area of man's experience where he might look and specify that this area was not fully God's. Whatever moved for healing and growth in physiology, whatever kept the rhythm of the galaxies and tides and earthquakes, whatever stirred and awoke and could be trained into an idea in man's mind, whatever maintained the dance of the molecules in matter, or the dance of souls in realms far beyond death, all of this was the same manifold and good producing one force. Yet because man's mind required him to postulate diversity in order to make the comparisons with which he might grasp and work with the laws of all creation, he must think of the divine in some way as manifold, as creative forces equally at work in their own nature and destiny within all that streamed toward him. While the Casey readings often used such a plural term for the divinity, reminiscent of the early Hebrew plural usage for the divine as Elohim, the readings turned sternly away from polytheism by alternating the usage with the phrase one force and by free use of such traditional phrases for the divine as Father, God, Lord, or sometimes Most High, or that might. Yet the Casey reading's distinctive usage remained that of referring to the divine as the creative forces to signify what the friends of God had meant when Susa spoke of the eternal wisdom or Eckhart of the all. Just as Plotinus spoke of the one, the Johannian writer spoke of light, Risbroek spoke of the unplumbed abyss, and Catherine of Geno spoke of pure love. 2. God's creation, seen in three modes. The intent of the case information did not seem merely to devise a colorful phrase, but rather to suggest how the human situation was one of intersecting diverse fields or forces, each of which was essentially good in its origin and operation and destiny, but was capable of being handled in unproductive combinations by man whose free will made him in a way that distinguished him from the rest of creation without separating him from it, capable of being a full companion or co-creator with God. These final fields were ultimately few, matter, mind, force. Force was the term used in place of spirit, apparently to suggest vitality and urgency and to avoid traditional dualism with matter. These three fields, matter, mind and force, were equally gods, so that man could not treat matter or nature as merely his plaything, his ecological toy or dump, but must understand that the creative forces were as fully present there as in the Godhead, however muted might seem their form of expression. 3. Man seen as a soul to understand himself, man would have to think himself as a being in which various fields and planes and dynamics intersected without losing their essential character. Some of these components were biological, while some were mental and cultural thought forms. But essential above all for understanding man was the nature and work of the individual soul which had its own mind and force. This soul was a psychological universe in itself destined to endure for eternity 
the soul would either grow through eons of time into full conscious willing partnership with God or it would turn away from its source and end until at last the soul was withdrawn to the divine minus its awareness of all it had learned and leaving both creation soul and the creator poorer by its betrayal of its destiny in such an outcome it might be like the prodigal son brought home unconscious and without this insight and choice in amnesia of all he had experienced and learned the soul was a living growing structure constantly putting forth new shoots of awareness and achievement that in time became part of its particular identity yet the soul also had a uniqueness originally given to it by God and had its own unblemished and fiery core of goodness which partook of the very Godhead itself in its quality and force the human soul was a reality as, a, as concrete as the infected ears of the or the Roman ducts or the laser type beams described by the readings the soul was not a hopelessly hidden reality but a structure that the individual was invited to find for himself through a growing awareness of its operation within his life and by entering into altered states of dream and vision and prayer where his soul might momentarily come before his consciousness in some comprehensible way as the ground of the total human person a totality which the Casey Tryon source called the entity the soul was one of the creative forces but it was only one of these forces the soul of every other man ought also to be seen as fully partaking of the creative forces however dimly actualized in that man's life further the creative forces flamed in every bush and blade of grass just as they did in outer space radiations are deep in the cell of a man's body or were given expression by the works of man's mind and hands in his positions and institutions yet the picture of the creative forces in the Casey Council was not pantheism not a model of God or as all there is for the one force whose nat nature was love had given man special resources which transcended nature and human nature to aid his growth into conscious co-op co-creatorship with God for the Holy Spirit and the Christ specifically there was the other force ever answering to the soul of man and seeking its own in the unique force of the soul this was the Spirit of God not identical with his outward creation but pulsing and flaming and coursing around man with its own instant intelligence which made fresh sense out of each situation and sought the good of all creation that took part in each event in the case he trans view this instantaneous and marvelous productive spirit holy in its loving tent was not a vague beneficence of God but a reality as concrete as any flash of radar or tug of gravity the Holy Spirit would always witness with the soul to polarize and guide a man as he let it do so and as he responded to the Holy Spirit's aid by growing itself giving maturity of service to others further this abiding spirit of the one force Holy Spirit had been focused for man deflected and brought into form and pattern which man might dare to think by the active presence and person and work of the Christ the Christ soul was first of all an example and a promise to man an earnest of his achievable destiny but the Christ soul was also literally a helper instantly available to begin to act upon any man who sought him through a process which ESP might dimly suggest but not explain to the Casey trans source this Christ was not a poetic abstraction not a collective image useful for Christian worship hundreds upon hundreds of times in the thousands of factual readings which Casey gave the factual reality of the living Christ was affirmed the tone of this affirmation was not dogmatic for he was offered as a reality reality to be sought and known by each individual not accepted on hearsay from Casey or any other source neither was the tone partisan presenting the affirmation as somehow validating centuries of Christian church life or centuries of lumbering Christendom the Christ force was simply there at work as the Sun and rain were at work 
men who align themselves with this with his quality of life would find him as they had caught his force many times in non-christian cultures and religions of past ages while those who simply identified with his institutionalized image and story might miss him indeed the quickest way to find the aid of this helping christ and of his very real unseen helpers in turn was to proceed just as he had said in whole-souled and loving service of those in need or pain such action would stir and direct christ's consciousness which was part of the birthright of every soul so that it would begin to make attunement to this steady reality this lodestar of the human journey the forces in many of its expressions the casey religious council sounded like the orthodox protest of Casey's waking church life. Yet there were in its unusual features that caught the attention of those who have studied Casey's readings during his lifetime and since. One of these features was the use of the term force. From the perspective of the entranced Casey, everything he saw appeared to be some kind of flux, some kind of process, some kind of charged field, often described as force. Casey in trance seemed impatient with the names of diseases whenever questionnaires used questioners used these names in ways that obscured the fundamental dynamics dynamics of the body as he saw them in the liver forces or the nerve forces. Similarly, the in trance Casey seemed to think of social movements and schools of thought as forces or vectors or fields rather than simply as institutional structures. The effect of the constant use of such imagery upon those who heard or studied many readings tended to be dissolution of a neatly compartmentalized Aristotelian world of discrete structures in favor of a worldview of swirls and pools and vortices and interacting charges, a righteous yet still lawful play of energies from many planes of reality meeting in both human and non-human spheres. When the trance attuned Casey signaled out the creative forces from his blooming, buzzing complexity, he seemed to single out whatever made for the harmonious yet playfully original fulfillment of anything in combination with its environment. He singled out such dynamics in a blood cell, in a petroleum deposit, in an idea of Bergson's, in minimum wage laws, in a child's love of his dog. He seemed to focus on that which kept true to its destiny in consort with other forces keeping their destiny. Evil, by contrast with the creative forces, meant destructive or uncreative or stagnant forces to be seen as developing in two ways. On the one hand there were accidents, said the unusual case source, even in creation, although these accidents were not so important as man would like to think when man sought to place the blame for his trouble affairs outside himself. But on the other hand, there was the far larger and critical evil which the doing of souls with their immense free will whenever they chose a destiny not appointed for them or stood less tall than their best potential. Like wayward children bemused at their power to alter a neighbor's garden, souls could and often did use their wills to interfere with the play of creative forces rather than to enhance that play. Because God had given souls freedom of will to match his own so that souls might in time become full companions with him, even he did not know whether souls would do good or evil until they made the distinctive choices. And while he would sometimes limit souls' avenues of growth and the exercise of power in order to educate them as a father lovingly educates his children to the consequences of their actions, he would not force souls to do his instantly and abundantly creative will. Only as souls might grow through their experience, through experience into fully willed choice of his ways, would they become worthy of their high calling to be heirs and joint heirs with Christ as God's own companions, his co-creators, his friends. The Biblical Psychology Model in this model of man with God in the Casey readings, those who have taken it up for serious study have found themselves confronted by what may be described as a biblical psychology. 
The modern was biblical in many of its fundamental concepts and metaphors, yet psychological in its emphasis on practical steps of exploration and growth. And the model had its own features on the nature of God who gives himself to friends, the nature of men who respond to the divine self-gift, the process in which men may have reliable knowledge of their relationship with God, and the way in which men may begin and grow in their search for fullest companionship with God. Nature of God Two themes ran through the Casey Council as it touched on the nature of God, His goodness and His availability for men. Nothing in the Casey readings better suggested the goodness of God than the handling of illness in the readings. Over and over the Casey source made the claim that there was no disease without a cure, though there were individuals too far advanced in a given illness to recover from it. Proving its claim of the goodness of God, the reading spelled out treatments for what seemed the most hopeless of ailments such as leukemia, brain damage, multiple sclerosis, cancer. While it did not offer simple regimes, though it pointed to simpler processes in such claims as the one that cancer might be prevented by eating almonds. It presented regimes which were effective often enough to invite serious further study of them. And it matched these regimes with a total physiology which made a compelling, if not coercive, picture of a universe where divine love had a remedy for every illness. In addressing the ailments of the human heart and family, poverty, ignorance, cruelty, desertion, betrayal and the rest, the Casey source drew the same fundamental picture. Through God's help there was an approach to meet every need, not instantly but through slow growth. The characteristic way of the Ocasi source for describing the prompt and definite aid of God was a New Testament quotation. God have not willed that any soul should perish, but have with every temptation provided a means of escape. By using the concept of temptation, the Ocasi readings implied a large measure of individual responsibility for illness and misfortune which sometimes shocked those who did not see the long journey of the soul as did the entranced Casey. But by stressing God's abounding goodness, the Casey source strove to set aside any sense of a punitive God bent on trying men by an invisible standard and demolishing them for their failures. Instead, the goodness and helpfulness of God as measured by human standards was not so much proclaimed by the Casey source but evidenced by it. Over and over the picture was called up for those who heard the readings of a blazing center of creation which instantly knew the very hairs on a man's head, the cells of a man's blood, the hopes of his childhood, the betrayals of his marriage, the unused talents of his mind, the financial opportunities about to confront him, or the friendships he should especially cherish. In the face of the staggering flow from Casey, the old question of philosophers, is the universe friendly to man, seemed momentarily absurd, especially as the helpful Casey flow was made more believable by its constant self-comparison with the helpful flow from the spirit in every man's dreams, in his workaday imagination, in his true intuitions of another's intent, in his wistful attunement to Christ in his support from the cradle of earth and the throne of culture. Yet the helpful, loving, creative God of which the Casey reading spoke and in whose spirit they were offered as helpful was not an unconscious river, not an impersonal, impersonal cornucopia of human goods. God is collective intelligence, taking each man personally in each man's actual relations with things and men and had ideas around him. This was a God who took his own initiatives with individuals, surprising them, daunting them, blessing them, forgiving them, daring them, calling them by name to be his unique companions. The goodness of the divine was not mercy and succour alone, but the mature love which seeks to stretch the loved one to his tallest in unflagging engagement which sometimes seems as much enmity as friendship. 
What was provided in the Casey trance was not might nor powers of God, but his goodness, helpfulness, productiveness, his love. But at the same time, the eminence of the divine was suggested in the Casey picture as his lawful availability to men. This was not a God engaged in winning men's obedience by stupefying them with miracles beyond their grasp. He sought not compliant servants, but friends with understanding. The Casey source reminded its listeners of scriptural assurances of God's faithful regularity. Try me and prove me, and though ye be far off, if ye call, I will hear and answer speedily. These and other passages were presented as the promises, major concept in the Casey religious thought. Such promises were commitments from God, as personal as any commitments between man and man. Yet, at the same time, they were also laws in the scientific sense of dependable processes. No word was more characteristic of the Casey material on man's relationship with God than law. Accordingly, the world view which emerged was not of a two-story cosmos of natural and supernatural realms, but a cosmos of one harmonious and complex reality in which all law was dependable rather than arbitrarily suspended. The God who showed his dependability when he brought us out of Egypt in the imagery of the biblical epic was not a potentate working his will upon the favoured and the unfavoured, but a reliable force with complex order and unity that invited man's study and cooperation not only in matters of the destiny of the soul, but in processes of healing or telepathy, of friendship or electronics, of forgiveness or forthrightness. Again and again the KC trans source insisted, God's law is his love. His regularity was the sign and the means of his caring. The lawfulness of God which made him eminently available to man was not, in the view of the entrance case, limited to the lawfulness in ritual and moral prescriptions and codes. This God, both good and demanding of growth, was not only a God of professionals, but also of parenthood, not only a God of initiations, but also of infiltrating corrupt institutions, not only a God of symbols, but also of surgery and pharmacy. He was a God of prayer, but also a God of pain, which he ever sought to lift from men by helping them to help themselves. He was a holy sec secular God, whose creative forces flowed and sparkled as helpfully and lovingly in business deals as they did in sexual tenderness and in the shifting currents of the oceans. He was holy because he was secular in his loving, so steadily available for any kind of shared growth. This was not a super parent gratifying man's whims, it was the Father. The Aramaic word which Jesus used came close to direct intimacy of Dan. The ultimate assurance of such rad radical closeness, such sure and quick availability of God, was his showing the way to friendship with him through the Christ. There might be seen a man like all other men who had showed in his very body, even while sweating and sleeping and troubled and tempted and bleeding and puzzled, that the way to full companionship with God was open to everyone, now and here, who would choose to, to walk the way of his friend. Nature of Man Turning to the Casey picture of the nature of man as that which might receive and respond to the divine self-gift, those who studied the Casey Council found another paradox. A very high view of man as made to be co-equal with God, combined with a firm picture of human sin and evil which kept man from his appointed state. Estate. The picture of the grandeur of the human soul as sketched by the Casey information was one to startle the mind. In the view of the Casey source, it was a plain fact that each person would find when he died that his identity and growth and companionship with others had not ended. Dreams and other experiences in altered states could show a man glimpses of post-death reality even before he died. Instead of dissolving or going into an in 
determinate state of suspension, each person after death would eventually find himself tugged onward into successively rich experiences that will quicken his understanding and love and usefulness until the time when he had literally reached that estate of skill and potency and goodwill which were fitting for a friend of God, a child of God, a helpmeet of God. The time would come unless the soul refused its opportunities as it was free to do when the individual soul could in effect eat and drink beauty, breathe out microcosms or macrocosms as creative holes and help to bear the pains of others in some far plane as sunlight bursts through clouds. The full destiny of each soul was not to, s to swear allegiance to some feudal Christ, but in essence to become Christ, to fulfill the whole pattern lived out by him, including the crucifying decision to set aside all selfish desires and appetites. Here the Casey view of man came to the daring perspective of that friend of God, Meister Eckhart, who wrote in one of the passages which helped to bring ecclesiastical censure to him. Our Lord says to every living soul, I became man for you. If you do not become God for me, you do me wrong. Eckhart's associate and friend of God, John Tola, spoke in similar terms in a sermon on the highest capacities of the soul uniting itself to God. Could such a man behold himself, he would see himself so noble that he would fancy himself God, and see himself a thousand times nobler than he is in himself, and would perceive all the thoughts and purposes, words and works, and have all the knowledge of all men that ever were. The Casey source not only suggests just such a view, but pointed to the helpful process exemplified in the readings as it had always been exemplified in the prayer life of the devout as living evidence that the soul of man could even now briefly reach towards such heights when the sole purpose was service and aid was sought from the comforter who will bring all things to your remembrance. To the case information, the far destiny of the soul was a matter as factual as the hardening of blood vessels in the destiny of the body or the inevitable revolution in the destiny of a nation which did not practice social justice. The calm yet intent speech of Casey in trance addressed the question of the nature and end of the human soul with the same helpful calmness and composure as when selecting a drug to stop an inf infection or when suggesting a specialist for a delicate procedure in surgery or physiotherapy. Nothing in the tone of voice or the outward manner of the trance attuned Casey betrayed to the listener that when Casey spoke of human destiny, he was shifting from inspection to speculation, nor developing rhetorical imagery only to impress listeners with the need for devout lives. In suggesting his high picture of human nature, making each soul as complex and precious to God as any galaxy and, and destined to be God's com conscious companion as no other part of creation could be, the counselling Casey also introduced a concept which startled both the man, Edgar Casey, to whom it was completely foreign, and most of his associates. The concept also alienated not a few who heard his readings and prompted many to view this schema as an error so grave as to cast doubt on the nature and value of his attunement. For beginning in 1923 with the psychological life readings, after Casey had established a solid record of two decades of medical aid to thousands of individuals, his information when asked described the journey of the soul as not only growth after death, but as growth before death, before birth. The entranced Casey spelled out a process of reincarnation and promptly put the Casey readings in a minority position within the mainstream of Christian mysticism. Characteristically, the process of rebirth was often set forth in the Casey readings through use of the biblical terms of Paul by reference to the old Adam in every man which must be made into the new Adam as Christ himself had both shown and made possible. Every man must have had originally in the inmost spirit of his life a seed of Christ. 
O Christ as a seed of heaven, lying there in a state of insensibility, out of which it could not arise, but by the meditatorial power of Christ, the word of God is the hidden treasure of every human soul, immured under flesh and blood, till as a day star it arises in our hearts and changes the son of an earthly Adam into a son of God. In the Casey view, each soul was indeed so like Christ in its high potential that it was worthy of the patience of God, while it grew through many experiences, both in the earth and elsewhere, to its full stature as a son of the Most High. Man's Relationship with God In the approach of the Casey Council to the question of how man might know ultimate truth about his relationship with God, two features were evident in the Casey model. A mystical emphasis on truth as found in an intimate personal search and an emphasis on the value of public inquiry through both biblical and psychological avenues. In the view of the Casey Council, the truth about friends of God which mattered most was not creedal formulas to which they might assent, nor principles or even laws which they might parent. It was truth which made a significant constructive difference in a man's way of life. He spoke of patterns of creativity which operated deep within each person as well as in the rest of creation. Such patterns resemble the structures and few fields which others from Plato on have called archetypes as the vehicles of religious knowing. These patterns in the Casey view affected many aspects of human growth, from physiological development through practical skills to spiritual transformation. Each pattern had first to be aroused or awakened within the depths of the person by the action of his own soul as it responded to the way in which he invested the output energies of his life and as it responded to the breath of the Holy Spirit. Once brought into active life, such patterns might be strengthened by the person's own insights and answering commitments the aid of other creative forces, the ideas and loving aid of associates, the resonating action of scriptures and traditions and rites and biographies, and the continuing witness of the Holy Spirit brought nearer by the Christ. As each new pattern itself partaking of the creative forces grew stronger within the individual, he would need to learn for himself its polarities, modes, limits, regularities and implications by experimenting and risking with it in many activities of his daily life. Only by such consistent and persistent application could he give flesh to the word which was growing within him as a pattern, some life-transforming grasp of patience, of compassion, of faithfulness, of integrity, of willing sacrifice, or some life-enhancing new talent of mind or strength or imagination. By its emphasis upon the necessary awakening of patterns of meaning within the person, the Casey source gave high importance to intuitive and introspective processes in the achievement of religious truth, including the essential processes of interior prayer and meditation, undertaken not for knowledge, but for growth in total communion and service with God. In this reliance on what William James called the immediate luminosity of truths, the Casey approach paralleled that in much historical mysticism of East and West. But in giving equal emphasis to knowing by doing through experimentation and trial regimes in both the little things and the great turning points of each life, Matched by careful rational reflection, it took an approach more familiar to the modern West. When the case information so often urged in a typically 
biblical phrase, in all things get understanding. It was not preceding such understanding as poetic quickening or visionary surmises alone, and it was not offering information or rule of thumb learning alone. It was pointing to tempered and systematically conceptualized understanding, criticized understanding, which might change a man's life. In describing the intensely personal nature of growth into final truths, the entranced Casey often observed, All ye may know of God, or man is within himself. His intent did not seem to be devaluing scientific method nor schools of thought, or institutionalized learning. He seemed rather to be trying to put these in their place. For in his view, God's ultimate dare in creation was not a body of abstract truths, not a truth-teaching institution such as church or temple, not a truth-bearing civilization such as some golden age of the past or future. God's final dare was individual souls whose uniquely one understanding was precious to him, since it made these souls his friends, his co-creators, rather than servants of transhuman structures. This emphasis upon individual growth into transformative truth startled not a few who heard and studied the Casey reading, since it ran counter to currents in the culture which put higher value upon bodies of thought held up by religious groups or by cultures. Yet it remained central in the Casey approach and was even used to rebuke some who appeared to exalt American lifestyles as absolutes, contrasting them with European systems of thought and government. Raise not democracy nor any other name above the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, warned Casey from his perspective and valued each man's growth so highly. The same emphasis could be seen in the great patience which, with which individuals from all walks of life were approached by the Casey information, as though there were infinite time to, in which to fully engage each soul in its own terms in order for it to take hold of ultimate truths. When pressed by others in the later years of his work, to give general readings and develop bodies of information rather than to give counsel to individuals, Casey sought guidance in a reading and was there abruptly reminded of what Jesus had done in his ministry. He took each as they came, was the counsel which maintained the consistent emphasis upon individual growth. Then came the added comment, pretty good pattern to follow, we are through with this reading. In this approach to religious truth as the personal achievement of each man who must grow into one piece at a time, the Casey source made no exception to itself as a source of religious knowledge. Those who found sense in the Casey religious concepts and tested them by application in their lives were encouraged to share their discoveries with others by formulating what they thought they had learned and how and why. This was the process specified for preparation of the little manuals called A Search for God, which were books of invitations, not revelations. But they were strongly warned that in speaking of Casey's trans developed ideas, they were to present these never as authority. The warning was needed for those who responded to the Casey model of human destiny with the divine were often tempted to quote his readings in order to witness to something which they felt important and to win reassuring responses from others. In their quoting of Casey, rather than sharing lived out experiences and tentative insights which might have been stimulated by the Casey aid, they were of course tempted by dominant patterns in surrounding church life which often made it all too easy to quote religious sayings as compelling truths rather than withholding these sayings until they could be cast into living experiences by the speaker in forms which invited their independent duplication and testing. Since many of Casey's hearers had grown up quoting the Bible in this rhetorical fashion, they found it easy to quote the readings or the information whenever some serious insight or commitment was stirred within them by the Casey Council. 
but they were consistently warned by this same council not to put weight upon private authority, including the authority of a strange prayer-induced trance, which others might find it difficult to duplicate. Instead, they were to do what the 14th century friends of God had spontaneously done long before them, write up their experiences, formulate their principle, set forth their understandings, borrow from the tongues and forms around them until others could take hold upon and test for themselves whatever they were trying to share. In every way, the Casey Council came down on the side of testing religious truths by their fruits rather than by their roots in supposedly inspired states as William James had so cogently put the distinction. The pragmatic and empirical quality of this approach to truth could be seen in the small test which the Casey saw sometimes offer to individuals as a means for weighing their progress toward ultimate wisdom. They ought to be able to discern, it said, that those about them in their work, in their homes, in their community affairs were increasingly glad to see thee come and sorry to see thee go. Not because of their superficial cheeriness or peppiness, but because their deepening understanding was making them more truly productive and loving people, as even their closest associates could see and come to trust. At the same time, it was placing such firm and consistent emphasis upon individual growth into religious knowledge, knowledge of life's ultimates. The Casey Council also made full use of two extra personal approaches to truth, as aids to clarifying the patterns and fruits found and sought in each life, and as aids to sensitizing the person to the ways of growth. One of these modes of religious knowing was biblical and the other was psychological. So freely did the Casey Council use both modes of thought and inquiry that those who studied the readings found it possible to set forth the entire Casey will reel in either mode, whether by using the biblical language and metaphors of the Father who sought hires and joint hires with Christ, or by using the language and metaphors of psychology and philosophy to suggest the relations of the self in its conscious and subconscious development toward final alignment with the creative forces. Casey's biographer Thomas Segrew has contrasted both modes in a closing chapter of There is a River, the story of Edgar Casey, which uses psychological and philosophical terms up to the last few pages of biblically cast direct quotes from the readings. This double use of theological and evocative language from man's love affair with God, alongside the psychological and denotative language of objective investigation put them in trance case in touch with two main streams of mystical thought and expression, both of which have often been noted by scholars and historians of mysticism. On the one hand, there have always been those mystics in both Christian and non-Christian traditions whose understanding of man's close relationship with God has expressed itself in terms of profound intimacy and communion as of child and parent, or lover and beloved, or friends with friend. Yet, on the other hand, there have always been those mystics in both Christian and non-Christian traditions whose passionate devotion to God has led them to describe the, the divine in impersonal terminology as the one, or the void, or the ground, or the abyss, towards which the soul moved by virtue of its spark along vibrations or emanations of the divine. Two temperaments rather than two realities have seemed to many thoughtful observers of mysticism to lie behind this divergent of expression. Those mystics freely at home in both modes seem to have been few. Like John Ricebroek of Flanders in that amazing 14th century which saw the friends of God in other high-level mysticism in the West, Edgar Cayce in trance, by contrast with Casey out of trance who relied so heavily on the Bible, seems to have moved with skill and sensitivity in both modes. To be sure, the quotations were so extensive in every type of Casey's readings 
that they involve most of the books of the Bible, some of them hundreds of times over in the 14,000 KC transcripts. But the purpose of the trance use of biblical quotations and allusions and paraphrases seemed not to be one of wrapping ideas in August authority, but rather one of stimulating or quickening something within the person as though calling it to his deeper memory by the biblical reference. Indeed, such an appeal to interior memory was the exact intent spelled out in some of the Casey Council where it was explained that a certain reference to the biblical exodus or to the Torah or to a saying of Jesus or to the solid faith of a prophet or apostle was offered by the Casey source because this material had been critically meaningful to the individual in a previous life. Calling to remembrance was the explicit purpose of using biblical language and worldview in such cases. At other times, when biblical language and metaphors were used in the Casey Council, such as God's calling and man's answering, covenants, judgment, being raised up or overshadowed, betrayal, obedience, sowing and reaping, the master, keeping a vow or trust, the intent seemed simply to reach the depths of the person being counseled through the powerful native imagery of the unconscious. Perhaps even it seemed at times to the writer through some activation of elements in a collective unconscious of western man sometimes doggedly sometimes eloquently the casey information drew upon and arranged biblical materials as though unwilling to let up until certain patterns of meaning seemed to tremble and quicken into life when within hearers every major feature of the biblical mythos as scholars sometimes refer to the whole biblical epic of God's relations with men, was freely used in this way from the Garden of Eden to the second coming of Christ. Yet it was not typical of the Casey trance source to wallow in vaguely evocative symbolism or to engage in the allegories which have so often lured mystics into thickets of an unconscious material. Usually the Casey Council included with a Bible reference or image some clear hint of the appropriate denotation or lawfulness within a given symbol or story of saying, so that a process of demythologizing, breaking the symbol by referring it to observable processes, was stimulated for the hearer, while at the same time the effort was made to preserve the full evocative force of the symbol in such richly laden accounts as Joshua's approach to Jericho, or Hannah's prayer for a man-child, or Abraham's prayer for a city to be saved by ten men of faith, or Magdalene's amazement at the empty tomb. Strikingly, those to whom the key symbols and epics of other faiths had strong personal meaning, whether through study or life abroad, or through intuitive empathy, which the entranced Casey sometimes credited to past lives in other cultures, were at times approached in Casey's readings not only with biblical imagery, but also with imagery which was Persian or Greek or Egyptian or Chinese or Muslim or from some other tradition. The evident effort in each case was to stir the person with symbols, which would make a direct resonance with structures in his own unconscious in some cases dramatically verifiable by the individual's own dream content from alien cultures, so as to quicken whatever patterns the Casey source saw as needful for the person's growth. This sensitive use of non-Christian references and imagery, wholly beyond the competence of the waking Casey, made it clear that the habitual trance use of biblical materials was part of a larger process finding truth within the lived-out experience of a dedicated people, rather than evidence of Western paracheolism in Edgar Casey, which molded his readings into biblical forms. Even while drawing upon the Bible for its intimate language of love of God, developed from its several peoples in successive centuries and overlapping cultures, the Casey transource held to its own norm of not offering any concept upon arbitrary authority, even upon the hoary authority of religious tradition. Always the insistence was there, 
explicit or implicit, that the individual must make his own empirical investigation of any truth, even one suggested to him from out of an old religious treasure of writings. To the perspective of the trans Titan casing, the Bible was not a book of rules, not a book of dogmas, but the funded experience of individuals and peoples who had sought each in their own way to be friends of God and had often failed as they had often turned again to the daring venture. Used in this spirit by the quietly speaking Casey in his trances, the biblical heritage, augmented by infrequent but accurate reference to how this heritage had been interpreted and used in centuries of church and synagogue history, came across as a family album, as a trip to the homeland of the soul, as songs wafted from a higher plane of existence where men had almost forgotten how to live. When offered in this way in the readings, and backed by Casey's sincerity in his personal Bible study, as well as by both the startling achievements and the painful trials which had failed, filled Casey's life, the Bible became, for many who heard it used by the Casey source, a treasure reclaimed, a believable account, Whatever its excesses of expression or zeal, of man's noblest kind of journey with the Most High. And because of the unique biblical emphasis upon the name and face of each of the Bible storied figures, there grew upon many who took the reading seriously the thought that God might indeed value a man's individuality so highly that he would seek each one as his co-creator, his friend. Yet directly beside the characteristic biblical references to faith and sin and fruits of the Spirit were woven, often in the same reading, the usages of thy discursive thought where the intention appeared to be precision of thought rather than evoking an immediate intuition or commitment within the person. Typical of the language in which the Casey source explored religious truth in this mode were such largely non-biblical terms as attunement, vibration, force, pattern, thought form, spiritual center, for vortices of energy associated with the body and the mind, and karma. Far from devaluing, devaluing reason or looking down upon careful reflection to correlate variables in physiology, history, business, physics, or psychology, the Casey Council used the terminology of all these disciplines at one point or another to point up truths about the human condition. It also urged others to study study with the same methods. The impression given to the careful, careful observer of the Casey Trans counseling was that the source of the reading saw such inquiry as much needed in order for seekers after truth to avoid the perils of a biblical symbolic method which might rely too heavily Upon the unconscious of for its knowing. Such perils and infla as inflation, legalism, identification, rationalization, and other familiar devices of the human mind will lift to luxuriate in symbols. Observing that the characteristic function of consciousness was comparison in order to arrive at reliable truths or laws, the Casey source constantly invited those who sought the weighter, weightier truths of their lives to make specific models for their thoughts, to test specific operations, to compare the action of defined variables or conditions until they could arrive at a dependable regularity or a universal. Facilitating this process, the Casey source at times picked up and used accurately the exact concepts which an inquirer was currently studying in the works of some philosopher or psychologist. Not do dogmatic about its own terminology, it was quite willing to use that of James or Bergson or, or Spensky or some other theorists familiar to the individual counselee, where equivalent terms could be found. Steps towards companionship with God but it was not language and metaphor alone which made the Casey material so strongly psychological that they resembled and disrespect the teachings of the Buddha. The Casey source was also psychological in its emphasis upon training upon concrete steps to take in the joint exploring of ultimate truths. 
Here it joined other mystics who have always tried to specify graded stations and steps in growth toward God, except that the Casey source used its own notable familiarity with medical processes and terminology, even at times citing a recently published technical study on a subject such as heredity and environment. In this operational approach, religious truth was never presented as hopelessly transcendent to the individual's reason to be accepted for its origin in divine fiat. To be sure, a man would have to put his reason to work by systemic study on specific questions and problems if he were to have its services, and he must expect his reason to be illuminated in altered states of consciousness reached in prayer and vision and dream and quickening. Such altered states were essential in the Casey trance view to enable one to grasp something of the nature of consciousness and personhood after death, as well as to validate or correct intuitions about the reality of reincarnation. But if reason were used in, in an existential way which backed it with the force of a man's life, it would give him much sound guidance, not alone only in religious ultimates, but in medicine and engineering and businesses, where the same ultimates were embedded in daily activities. Indeed, a man could not hope for repeated guidance from the Spirit in the practical and theoretical questions of his life if he did not use his reason as far as it could be stretched without forcing. In the Casey view, the soul would respond with true intuitions of the patterns in events only as the conscious mind carried its full load. And the biblical promise had been for the spirit to bear witness for man's of it. Yet better than reason used alone, in this perspective was reason resonated against the traditions of a devout community seeking to work and live as friends of God. Exemplified, exemplified in the biblical tradition but also in serious study groups, as well as in the shared lives of dedicated artists, scientists, businessmen and political leaders who were drawn to Casey for counsel at different points in his life. And even such tradition, illumined reason, would serve man best if further prompted and nudged by the manifestations of the spirit which the trance heightened Casey saw in terms often used by mystics before him, the inner voice, the still small voice, and the inner light as that which convicts, convinces. This kind of subjective phenomenon, not metaphoric but real, found in both dreams and waking states, could be developed to both guide a man to unknowns and tip the balance of his rational reflections in the direction of verifiable truth. Only such patient attention both to symbol-laden tradition and the inward prompting found in silence and waiting could cure reason of its excesses of pride and oversimplification, as well as avoid the familiar traps of trivial speculation and substitution of thought for deed. Further, reason as psychological understanding raised to the level of mature wisdom would be needed to distinguish among non-rational currents of the unconscious such as the automatisms and compulsions and fascinations, which too often masqueraded as the inner action of the spirit. Casey's dream interpreting readings were filled with guidance to such rational discrimination in the Dali-like landscape of dreams. In encouraging each individual to use his reason to ferret out lawful regularities in his own experience, and to compare these with the promises of the Bible, the trance counseling case he was not ab advocating solitary reflection alone. He was also advocating systematic public research within communities of qualified and reasoning men. Not merely personal search, but disciplined research was the goal repeatedly set before those who took seriously the Casey phenomenon and ideas. This emphasis could readily be seen in the name of Association for Research and Enlightenment, which was chosen in 1932 by laymen interested in studying the Casey materials, and seen in the name of the body which preceded it and built the Casey Hospital, 
the Association of National Investigators. Often in the years of development of both associations as membership societies, the responsible leaders in each and Casey himself were reminded by this information that they were too tempted to indulge in enlightenment without the requisite public research. The consequences of such imbalance, they were warned, would be to make Casey's useful work into the property of a private in-group or cult, cynicism or ism, rather than leti- letting Casey's aid stimulate them into disciplined covenants of inquiry with those who were trained in medicine, psychology, religion or other areas and who might match their own lay experiences, projects and publications with technical skill which in the long run could only enhance Casey's contribution. The Casey source showed no fear whatever that constant exposure of its ideas, whether medical or psychological or historical or theological, to comparison with those of other theorists or trained specialists, would bring discredit on the Casey materials or lead to watering down of whatever was useful in Casey's counsel. Like a superb athlete or astronomer or surgeon who feels he knows what he knows, Casey in trance and Casey out of trance showed no concern that his ideas would be lost in an unfriendly world through a process of comparative and intensive research. Nothing less than open-minded research within communities of research would be found to carry forward the kind of concern to relieve pain in its many varieties which had been Casey's deep personal motivation from the start of his strange gift and was presented by his readings as a motivation close to the heart of God in his love for friends. Yet, along with this vigorous concept of research, the idea of enlightenment in the Casey readings kept in the view of Casey and his associates the insistence of the trans source that knowledge of ultimates about God and man should transform an individual, not merely indoctrinate or inform him. The sense of this enlightenment was not that of reason's triumph over all mysteries as in the phrase used to describe the age of enlightenment in Western history, nor was the sense one of missionary zeal such as that which had led Christians to seek to enlighten their neighbours of other faiths in far lands, sometimes with the sword. And it certainly was not self-centered prudence, as seen in the phrase enlightened self-interest. Rather, the usage of this term in the Casey materials was a more biblical one, suggested by the Joam 9 image of the light that lightens every man in the world who receives it as his own. Christification by the action of the soul's inward light answering to that light in the Christ was nearer to the meaning of this kind of enlightenment where each soul might seek the old mystical goal of becoming a true son or friend of God. Further, the intent of this image was not rhetorical but had a concrete reference to the typical mystical experience of having consciousness filled with light in times of closest communion with God. Such melting, transformative illumination might come to any man who sought to grow by successive awakenings to match with ardent doing into that understanding which Jesus had said apart from friends, servants of their Lord. Over and over in the years of Casey's life and since his death, there have been some who have seen in the sweeping Casey picture of the soul's destiny with God a vista which has caught and held their attention. They have made their own informal projects to discover how far the Casey mural might match their own first-hand explorations. Some have looked far into their hearts to discover how great might be the love and goodness buried beneath their defences and safely shallow routines. Some have stared long at the faces of both friends and strangers, asking whether the majesty of full companions of God might be traced in the lines, the smiles, the grave solemnity of these faces. Others have taken a long look at reincarnation for the first time in their lives 
and have turned to their dreams and their intuitions to seek for the memories which Casey had said were never completely beyond the reach of consciousness. And still others who had conducted their own interior quarrel with the seeming cruelty of life asked themselves whether the events of the lifespan might be squared with the vision of a stupendously just God whose laws were also his mercy. There have been those who have picked up the Bible in the spirit of adventure for the first time, as they might look at the record of magnificent voyages or to new lands. And there have been those who tried for the first time to formulate into testable principles the impressions and hunches about the laws of living, which had been collecting in the backs of their minds for years. Whenever their poking and pondering, their risking and their reflecting led them to look back with startled interest to the Casey model of friends of God, they found themselves somehow stirred to begin a new life. As the consequence of watching the helpful Casey gift at work in counselling the trouble was a hunger for a new life of unstrained but fruitful potency, so the consequence of studying the Casey conceptual model of man with God was for these people a hunger for true relationship and closeness to God. It was a hope for closure, a hope to be nothing less than a companion, a friend of the unfathomable, unfathomable Most High who was yet the nearest one to each human heart. The look which came into the eyes of those who stumble upon such hope for closure as the writer saw often in Casey's lifetime and afterward was the kind of wonder and delight in another being which comes into the eyes of lovers or of parents gazing at their romping children, or of clients who no longer need the therapist but will not forget him, or of friends speaking deep and even painful but life freeing truth between them. Not intimacy, not emotional thrills of breaking through barriers and defenses, but something far more solid seemed to lie in this hope for true belonging, as when a man acknowledges who are his true countrymen for better or for worse or recognizes at a distance the lined face of someone who has suffered and grown with him in a noble struggle. As some suggested, when they tried to express their response to the far-raging Casey picture of human nature and destiny, they felt that the sudden tug to be a friend of God was the secret which had somehow eluded them in all close relationships. The noiseless beckoning from nowhere that came over them on a sunny day and the peculiar joy in the unseen force that blew a boat sail or a child's kite. The sense was someone is indeed there to whom you must now turn as often you have begun to do. Tolstoy wrote at of just such a life-shaping turning of his own after several years of inward desolation and doubt in a passage which William James translated from the Russian. I remember one day in early spring, I was alone in the forest, leading my ear to its mysterious noises. I listened and my thoughts went back to what, for these three years, it always was busy with the quest of God. But the idea of him, I said, how did I ever come by the idea? And again there arose within me, with this thought, glad aspirations towards life. Everything in me awoke and received a meaning. Why do I look further? A voice within me asked. He is there, he without whom one cannot live. Some of those who responded in this way to the Casey picture had long been religious, but in the spirit of, a spirit of approaching God dutifully and demandingly, as does a fretful child, its parents, and guarantor. For them, the glimpse of quite another kind of relationship with God co-creating events from handshakes to far-off worlds of light stopped them in a hushed silence. Some who had long given pious honour to Jesus caught in a sidelong glance their own glimpse of him as vital, humorous, gifted, lonely and helpful perhaps, but not so much a marvellous superman as true friend of God in step with his father's stride. Through such reflections they reported, the old human longing for position, for priority, for favour and justification before God seemed at times to drain away as a needless stain on man's relationship with God, leaving only righteous, adventurous companionship 
which found the high spirit of sharing in creation so good that no external rewards need be asked of the sharing. Some spoke in terms reminiscent of those of Teresa of Spain, writing centuries before them of what it feels like to begin to know, draw near to God. I know of no other words whereby to describe or explain it, neither does the soul then know what to do, for it knows not whether to speak or be silent, whether it should laugh or weep. It is a glorious folly, a heavenless madness, wherein true wisdom is acquired, and to the soul a kind of fruition most full of delight. There were those who had never given much thought to their personal relationship with God. A few of these commented, when struck with hope by their pondering on the Casey biblical psychology, that they thought they now understand a certain fierceness in their loving and indeed in all their demands upon others, where they had sought a companionship which others alone could never quite fulfill, and others noted the puzzling and daunting sense of nostalgia which at times had gripped them in settings of nature's most free play with trees or seas or mountainscapes or creatures when some part of them seemed just on the verge of reaching out to touch that which was not man and yet as close to man as flesh itself. Still others spoke of the unaccountable lure which they had sometimes felt in travel to far places or in reading of other lands and times as though a precious memory were just on the edge of the mind, a memory of true belonging, true and unpossessive closeness which had eluded them in their daily lives. Yet the longing suggested in these spontaneous images, the longing to have a new life of direct friendship with God, was not merely a devotional longing to be a surge in worship. Far from excluding human companionship in favor of cloisters, it seemed to them the seed of meaning in all fully human touching and tugging and embracing, making possible newly playful friendship with other distant companions of the same one. Those who had found themselves asking under the force of the example of Edgar Cayce's life and gift, what can I now do with my life that it might be productive of helpful goodness as never before, now found themselves also asking under the impact of their ventures at testing the Casey model of man with God, to whom can I now belong so that I am most truly myself and can bring forth the jauntiest and loveliest best in the others to whom I come close. To the question of potency they join the question of closure, as men of many ages have found the riddles of their faith caught up in the twin acts of work and loving, when they could frame any answer to their questions at all. It was not typically offered in tones of heavy solemnity, but in the sparkling, racy high spirits which mystics have so often said were fitting for friends of God. As Evelyn Underhill wrote of the same sense of high play of God in the lives of historic Western mystics, they enjoy the high spirits peculiar to high spirituality and shock the world by a delicate playfulness instead of exhibiting the morose resignation which it feels to be proper to the spiritual life. Stirred by the prospects of a new life which they thought they had seen, those who responded to the Casey conceptual model turned back to the same trance council to seek there the conditions of an exuberant friendship with God. And in the Casey readings they found four activities, four procedures that, by which any man might begin a totally new life. These were activities which the writer heard offered scores of times in those who sought Casey's trance aid on physical ailments, on marital discords, on vocational longings, on seeming memories of past ages, on puzzling dreams of the night, and on their mental and spiritual pilgrimages with the one. Together these four steps made up their own form of balanced practical mysticism, often for any man who felt the unsubduable tug to lift the pain of his brothers, together with the tug to defenseless prayer, and guessed that God himself, the creator and author of all visible and invisible realms, might indeed be so close, that a man alone in his study would cry out to him as though face to face, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.